the WHO is warning about disease X, and they're urging countries to sign a pandemic treaty. Well, what is disease X and what exactly is in this treaty. We will be discussing that and much more today. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. They've got an awesome deal right now. They've got a special on free bacon if you order and subscribe today. So go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Tuesday. Hope everyone is having a wonderful week so far. If you haven't listened to yesterday's episode about why marriage is awesome, not just for individuals, but also for society in general, then go listen to that. All the red pill bros and Andrew Tate and all the naysayers about marriage on Twitter are all wrong. They're wrong. And Christian marriage in particular stands apart. It stands apart from the rest of the marriage statistics and the doom and gloom stories that you hear about marriage. Christian marriage is where it's at. Christian marriage offers not just the utmost stability for the people involved, but also for nations as a whole. So listen to that. Lots of statistics, lots of insight from a UVA professor on yesterday's episode. All right, a few things before we get started in talking about Disease X. An announcement, we've got a restock on AllieMerch.com. Y'all's favorite t-shirts ever are back in stock. We've got our Do the Next Right Thing in Faith with Excellence and for the Glory of God. We've got lots of cute colors on that, even Related Bro friendly colors. We've also got our Razor Respectful Ruckus shirts that are back in action for y'all. And I love these shirts. I wear these shirts all the time. And my sweatshirt with Do the Next Right Thing on there as well. So go to AllieMerch.com and you can check those out. They are now restocked just for you. Um, And a couple other things I just wanted to touch on. Sometimes I like to reiterate something that I talked about on Instagram because you guys had such a reaction and a response to it that I just want to reiterate it on the show and then we can just discuss it. We can discuss it on Instagram. We can discuss it in the comments of YouTube. But a couple observations, just random. They don't go together at all. They don't have anything to do with the rest of what we're talking about today. But because I've just been thinking about them, I wanted to put it out there and see if I was the only one. And no, I'm not talking about the grease stains that I talked about on Instagram. A lot of you guys did relate to that about how I just get these like random spots on my clothes that look like they're water spots, but they're not water spots. There are some kind of grease or something, and I don't know what causes them. There's a lot of different theories out there. I don't use fabric softener. I don't use liquid detergent. So that was some, that, that was one theory, but I did use some Dawn dish soap and some dissolve it and some OxyClean, and I'm going to see what works best. So, but, but that's not what I'm talking about. But those are some solutions if you guys are struggling with the same thing. We've got a lot of laundry woes in the relatable family. The thing I was going to say, one, here's one message to those of you, and this is in particular women and maybe some influencers on here who are using Instagram and you use filters on your face or on your videos. So there are some filters out there that just change the color or whatever, and I think that's fine. I'm not really talking about those. I'm talking about the filters on Instagram, maybe on maybe on Snapchat too. I don't know. I'm not on Snapchat. Maybe on TikTok. I'm not on TikTok. That change the shape of your face. So if you don't know, there are filters out there that change like uh, what your mouth looks like, what your nose, it basically like erases your nose. I don't know if you guys have noticed that, but filters on Instagram basically make it look like the person talking doesn't have a nose. It changes their eyebrows and their eye shape. It makes their face thinner. And I really think that some people who use these filters, they get addicted to it. They get addicted to what they look like with that filter, and it makes them really embarrassed of what their image actually looks like in real life. And, you know, there was a time when these filters were new where I was using some of those filters and I thought it was cool and it makes you look so pretty. But then you get discombobulated when you see yourself in the mirror or when the filter goes away and you're like, ugh. Um, Okay, here's my challenge to all of us. Let's be filter-free. 
in 2024. Maybe filler free too, but that's a whole different story. Filter free in 2024, because here's the thing. There is nothing good about, there's nothing good about those kinds of filters that change what your face actually looks like, because really you're lying. You're lying not just to other people about how you look. I mean, who wants to be seen in person? And then the reaction is, oh, wow, you look totally different than the person that I saw on Instagram. But also you're lying to yourself. And I think this is the bigger issue. And this is something I'm saying this is someone who went through this myself, okay, a few years ago realizing that I was disappointed when I looked in the mirror because I didn't look how I looked with those filters. It does nothing to help foster the contentment that we're called to as Christians and the gratitude that we are called to as Christians. And I think it makes us very discontent, very dissatisfied, and probably can pave the path for eventually injecting things in our face and spending a lot of money trying to reverse the aging process when in reality, scripture tells us that aging is a blessing. And look, I know it's difficult being someone who is in front of the camera all the time and who I follow a lot of, you know, uh, beautiful commentators, people in the news and things like that. And it's so easy to compare yourself. I just turned 32 over the weekend and I am certainly seeing lines on my face that I didn't see when I was 25 or even 28. And it is so tempting to want to erase those things or to try to, you know, I don't know, in, inject something in your face, however Botox and fillers work, to make yourself look different than you are. And I think filters, even though they're not permanent and they don't last as long, they kind of serve the same function as trying to erase the natural process of aging. And I just think that all of us probably need to check our hearts a little bit and to one, examine our motives behind those things, but also just ensure that we are doing everything that we can to foster contentment. I'm not against taking care of ourselves using sunscreen and using skincare that works well for us, um, but I, I do just get worried and maybe it's because I'm a mom of daughters now and I just worry so much about them entering into this world in which what you actually look like is never good enough and what it does to a, per a person's heart and mind and soul, I worry about that. Not just individually when it comes to myself or my friends or my kids, but also what it does to an entire generation, like what it does to a nation. And I know maybe you're thinking I'm thinking too much about that, but that's part of why I have this podcast. I think too much about things and then I talk about them. So that's my challenge. Let's do No Filter 2024. That's what, that's what I am trying to do. That is what I am doing. And that's what I encourage you to do too. And let us foster contentment and gratitude about the face that God has given us. Um, okay, that's one little thought. And I have another thought. Uh, I might share it. But first, let me pause. Let me tell you about our first sponsor for the day. What do I want to go with? Let's go with Carly Jean Los Angeles. Of course, I am wearing all Carly Jean right now. My Carly Jean Los Angeles jacket, my Carly Jean Los Angeles tank, my Carly Jean Los Angeles jeans. And I didn't even plan that. It's just because that's basically the only thing I wear because I love CJLA so much. It just fits me so well in every stage of life. I still consider myself postpartum. It's been almost six months since I had my last baby and I'm still not looking and feeling exactly like I would like to takes me a while, but I want clothes that I can feel good in, that I can still feel like I look cute in, that can make me feel comfortable in my skin, even if the scale isn't exactly where I want it to be. And that's why I love CJLA. At every stage of my life and every season of the year, they help me feel good in the skin that I'm in with really high quality clothes that are flattering and that fit really well. It also helps that it's a company run by a family who loves the Lord. They love America. They share the same values that you and I do, and they're totally unapologetic about that. You can get a really good deal as my listeners by going to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Use code RELATABLE25 for $25 off an order of $125 or more, or code RELATABLE50 for $50 off an order of $200 or more. Go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Use promo code RELATABLE25 or RELATABLE50. Okay, never mind. I don't have time to share the other thought. 
that I shared on Instagram about like about privacy and having to basically sign over our privacy when we participate in society. I'll save that for another day. Maybe I'll save that uh, for Thursday. We really just have to get into the main subject of today's episode, which is disease X. This is a subject that you guys have been asking me to talk about for a long time now. And honestly, I've been hesitant to do so just because it's such a big topic. There are so many different aspects of it, and I want to make sure that I cover it as accurately as I possibly can. And we probably won't get into every nook and cranny today. There will probably be things that if you've been studying this or looking at this, reading about this for a while, you'll wonder, wait, why didn't you talk about that? Why didn't you go down that trail? And it's probably just because I didn't have time or I just didn't have the capacity to put that all together in a research document. So I'm going to do the best that I can to give you an overview of what disease X is. And if you haven't heard of it, you are about to have at least a really good basic understanding of what I'm talking about and why we need to care about it. The last thing that I want to do is make us paranoid, but we do want to be prepared, right? So not paranoid, but prepared. And in order to be prepared and to make sure that our family is taken care of the best way that we can, these people that God has given us to steward and protect, uh, we have to know what's going on. We have to know what's being talked about at places like the WHO. Now, the WHO, the World Health Organization, pre-2020, most people never thought about the WHO. We didn't care who was the head of the WHO. We didn't care what was going on there. Maybe we should have, but honestly, we only have the capacity to care about so much, and usually that's the stuff right in front of us. We don't have the time or the energy to think about what's going on at the UN, what's going on at the WHO. But now COVID has taught us that we have to actually care about that. And the things that they say will eventually come to fulfillment unless the people who have now woken up do something about it. So that's why we have to know what Disease X is all about. So the World Health Organization first used the term Disease X in 2018 to warn countries about the danger of unknown viruses and urge them to prepare for potential future pandemics. It was discussed at, again, at the January 2024 World Economic Forum meetings in Davos. If you haven't listened to my episode with Justin Haskins about that, you should go listen to it. Really all my episodes with him, but particularly this last one to hear about what was actually discussed at the WEF this year. So it was discussed in January and experts were warning that a future unknown disease could be 20 times more fatal than COVID-19, which is pretty significant. I mean, even if you're looking at the most conservative numbers that there was like a 0.1% fatality when it came to COVID 20 times, that is still uh, significant. There was a session titled Preparing for Disease X at Davos this year. It included the director of the World Health Organization, which people typically They just refer to him as Tedros. He's the director general, and he is from Ethiopia. Now, just a pause. I did this episode back in 2020. I did a deep dive into Tedros, and he is a very uh, corrupt figure himself when he was the leader of um, health care. I forget the specific title of what he was in Ethiopia, I guess like the what would be here, like the head of our HHS, um, he covered up a cholera outbreak there. And he didn't prepare for a well-known disease in Ethiopia. And he probably cost thousands of lives because of his lack of preparedness and corruption. Of course, when you are on the left and you're a part of this kind of regime, you fail upwards, just like Fauci did. You get rewarded for your failure if you're willing to do the things that corrupt entities want you to do. And so he's the head of the WHO. While he was the head of the WHO back in 2017, he tried to tap a Zimbabwe dictator, murderous dictator, a Marxist dictator, Robert Mugabe, as the goodwill ambassador. And that caused such a stir. People were so mad about that. He got so much backlash because, I mean, it's it was too um, it was too obvious. Okay, you are going to tap another corrupt African leader who was responsible for thousands and thousands of murders and the complete uh, destruction of the Zimbabwe economy. 
and uh, their health care system. You're going to tap that guy to be in a leadership position in the WHO. And so that actually ended up falling through, thankfully. But Tedros is not a good guy. And this is who we have at the helm. That means, though, that we really need to listen up when he is warning about things, when he's talking about things, because unfortunately, to our great dismay, they will probably come into fruition. So he emphasized um, at the government summit in Dubai last week that it is a matter of if not when our world faces another pandemic. As WHO emphasizes the inevitable danger of disease X, they are also pushing for countries to sign their pandemic preparedness treaty. And this is what a lot of people have been warning about for several months, which critics believe is a push for the WHO to have centralized power over critical controversial issues like quote unquote misinformation in the international supply chain. Quite frightening. This is this was really the focus. This misinformation piece, so-called, was really the focus of Davos this year and how the powers that be can try to clamp down on what they call misinformation, which, of course, is just opinions that progressives don't like. It's just facts that progressives don't like. It is counter narratives to the official approved narrative of people like George Soros at all. Um, So Disease X was trending over the weekend Uh, at the World Government Summit in Dubai. The World Health Organization told global leaders that a new pathogen and pandemic will strike sometime, uh, sometime soon. Just a reminder also that Tedros is not a medical doctor. He's not a medical doctor, but he used the opportunity to emphasize the need for a global pandemic treaty and to dismiss suspicions, suspicions of it being a WHO power grab. So here he is saying that in Dubai. History teaches us that the next pandemic is a matter of when, not if. It may be caused by an influenza virus or a new coronavirus or it may be caused by a new pathogen we don't even know about yet, or what we call disease X. Okay, so that's frightening. He says, although some progress has been made, like improvements in surveillance, improvements in surveillance, hmm. the pandemic fund, building capacities in vaccine production, the world is not prepared for a pandemic. The painful lessons we learned are in danger of being forgotten as attention turns to the many other crises confronting our world. We will pay dearly next time and there will be a next time. He said in preparation for the next outbreak um, that they have to sign a treaty. So the nations have to come together. They have to sign this international agreement on pandemic preparedness. This is what people are very concerned about. Uh, With just 15 weeks left on the timeline that was agreed upon in 2021. Of course, this is happening in an election year. Uh, Tedros said that the treaty, uh, which the Biden administration has been involved in negotiating, is a set of commitments by countries to strengthen the world's defense with a one health approach. So they're not quite on the nose saying one world government because they know that's the center of many conspiracies, a one health approach. And I know our friend Justin Haskins, who knows more about the WHO and the WEF and the UN than probably anyone else out there, he tells us that this is not, they're not pushing communism, which of course is true, but it is still this kind of collectivist mentality, this kind of progressive Marxist idea uh, that there is no real thing as human nature and innate differences in different kinds of people that if the right people take power, then they can put everyone under one regulation in one set of rules. This is also the idea behind borderlessness. We can just mush everyone together. These oligarchs on top can just take control, distribute uh, power and resources at rights as they see fit and everything will be fine. That's true whether it comes to, you know, one world bank or bank or whether it is talking about one health. The fact of the matter is, is that the world is extremely diverse in a lot of ways. 
there is such thing as human nature. People groups are different. Cultures are different. Not every different kind of person can mush together. Borders exist for our protection. Languages exist for distinctive reasons. Um, And trying to mush everyone together and put them under one regime is a recipe for absolute and total evil disaster and has a very... um, I'd say in timesy feel. Uh, so, but he said, look, we need this treaty. It's going to absolutely keep people safe. That We need a consensus from all of these governments that they're going to do everything that they need to be prepared for this next pandemic. So he said, here are some reasons why it hasn't been signed yet. And time is of the essence, he's saying. He says, nations have some differences. However, he was confident uh, that they could be worked through. Number two, the second major barrier is the litany of lies and conspiracy theories about the agreement. Of course, people talking about their concerns with our loss of sovereignty as a nation, and that's what critics are saying. They're just fear mongers. They're just liars and conspiracy theorists. He said that it's a power grab by the WHO, that it will cede sovereignty to the WHO, that it will give WHO the power to impose lockdowns or vaccine mandates on countries, that it's an attack on freedom, that WHO will not allow people to travel, and that WHO wants to control people's lives. These are the lies that are being spread. If they weren't so dangerous, these lies would be funny. But they put the health of the people at risk, and that is no laughing matter. Uh, Let me be clear. The WHO did not impose anything on anyone during the COVID-19 pandemic, not lockdowns, not mask mandates, uh, not vaccine mandates. We don't have the power to do that. We don't want it, and we are not trying to get it. Um, Now, I hope that that is true. I hope that it is not um, robbing America or any country of its sovereignty. I hope that it is not giving itself the power to impose these kinds of lockdowns. But that's certainly what critics believe is exactly uh, what's going to happen. So we're going to talk about why people are afraid of that in just a second. Let me pause. Let me tell you about our next sponsor for the day. This is the perfect sponsor for what we're talking about, and that is my Patriot Supply. I mean, these people are kind of like the experts in not being paranoid, but being prepared. They want to prepare you with an emergency food supply should you ever need it. Hopefully you don't, but you get this three-month emergency food supply kit from My Patriot Supply, and you can store it. You can store it for up to 30 years. It's good to go. You give you and your family 2,000-calorie-a-day meals should you get in a situation where you're unable to get your food in your in your water the normal way. And you'll want to get a food supply kit for every member of your family, so they'll be good to go for three months. Uh, They're good for 25 years in storage, actually, not 30 years. And they do provide over 2,000 calories a day. Go to preparewithallie.com and you will get a great deal when you do. Go to preparewithallie.com. So here's the deal. While the WHO doesn't technically have authority right now to impose lockdowns on countries. They can't legally come in as it is and arrest people for not wearing a mask. However, they were seen as the authority uh, during the pandemic, during the height of COVID. Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, um, really the entirety of the administrative state, even local officials, commentators would all cite the WHO as the reason for imposing or advocating for imposing vaccine mandates and lockdowns and mask mandates. And really, even I would say the WHO was more if conservative, if you want to use that word, or less stringent when it came to max, uh, mask mandates and vaccine mandates than a lot of the Democrats were here. I mean, they didn't recommend masking, I think it was kids under 10, the WHO, and yet Democrats here, of course, said, well, if you're two years old, you can't even fly without wearing a mask. Child abuse, child abuse is insane. But 
the WHO and their suggestions absolutely played a huge role in implementing the policies here in the United States and elsewhere that robbed people of their freedom, of their rights, and of their livelihoods. Absolutely. Um, in March 7th, 2020, the WHO said that we should use China as a model. Now, remember, China was locking people in their homes. People were starving to death in China because they literally had their doors welded shut by the dictatorial regime in China. And of course, mask mandates and all of that. Now, they flip-flopped a lot, the WHO did, on masks. They first said there's no evidence that wearing a mask will help. And you heard Dr. Fauci saying that. And then in June of 2020, and I remember this switch. I, I really do. I remember we went on vacation to Florida and I saw a few people wearing a mask inside. And at that point, people weren't wearing masks. This was June of 2020. We got home and all these celebrities and all these commentators we're saying, oh, if you're not wearing a mask, you're killing grandma. I remember that switch. I remember March of 2020, Fauci giving that interview saying, ah, oh, mask isn't going to help and rolling his eyes at it. And then June of 2020, it was like, if you don't wear a mask, you are basically Ted Bundy. Uh, the WHO has updated its guidance. They said to advise that to, pre uh, that to prevent COVID-19 transmission effectively in areas of community transmission, governments should encourage the general public to wear masks. Um, the guidance for religious leaders on avoiding large group gatherings, the WHO encouraged churches to not meet as they typically did. Sermons and messages can build on factual information provided by the WHO. So they encourage religious leaders, if they were giving sermons, to make sure that they are repeating the lines given to them by the WHO, which is just very uh very frightening when you think about it. They gave guidance uh, to schools. They did say children under five should not be required to wear a mask. Uh, children six through 11, though, said that they should. Again, we had absolutely no data whatsoever to support this idea of mask mandates in schools, really of mask mandates in general, but specifically for children. That led to a loss of learning and development and social skills and a rise in anxiety and paranoia. We had lots and lots of research showing us that for these influenza type and, respir and respiratory illness uh, type diseases, sicknesses, that these masks were not helpful at all um, and could actually be counterproductive. I don't blog, but I wrote a whole blog post that put all of this information and all of these peer-reviewed studies together from the past 20 plus years showing that masks really don't help. And it was crazy. It was like a religion for some people. And they looked to like the WHO as God. So even though Tedros is technically right, that they did not impose all of these regulations on these countries, they absolutely knew that they held a position of authority and that local and national um, health officials would take their cues from the WHO and make their policy decisions based on that. So we do have the WHO at least in part to blame uh, when it comes to this, not to mention, not to mention that this outbreak shouldn't have happened in the first place if the WHO had been doing its job, if it wasn't so scared, if it hadn't been so scared of China, the UN and the WHO always kowtow to China, this corrupt, dictatorial, communist regime, and refuse to actually research uh, what went on and how this happened at the Wuhan lab. And if it actually originated in the Wuhan lab, the whole lie that spread that it was from bat soup. It's, oh my gosh, can you even believe that people believed that at one point? Uh, that it was from bat soup. The WHO helped fan the flames of that propaganda. The WHO may have also covered up the beginnings of this outbreak, which was probably toward the end of 2019 when people started reporting this kind of pneumonia-like illness happening in certain areas of China. Um, and so that's why I actually brought up the corruption of Tedros that we've seen going back several years because it is very likely that he is still corrupt uh, to this day and um, that he is also probably in bed with the Chinese Communist Party. We know that the Chinese uh, Communist Party uh, also wants to see the demise of the West. 
and wants to see the weakening of the U.S. dollar, wants to see the division of and the weakening of the United States in general, wants to see a weaker American economy, and knows that the less that we rely on ourselves to supply the things that we need, the more we'll rely on China. So I promise if the WHO takes over the supply chain for whatever reason, that is going to benefit China. Really, the WEF in general, all these entities um, are very supportive of China, which is interesting because they are one of the greatest perpetrators of human rights abuses on Earth. So that just shows you the priorities of where everyone is. All right. So is it true? Is is Tedros right? These are all just conspiracy theories that you've been hearing about this treaty and that it's not really ceding sovereignty, that we have nothing to worry about. It's just a one health approach. Anytime I hear one anything, again, I'm going to be very skeptical. Um, or are the critics right? Are the people trying to sound the alarm about this? I've seen Michelle Bachman, for example, um, give several interviews where she's been trying to sound the alarm about what's going on. Well, let's see. Let's see what the treaty actually says. So conservative critics here in the United States have said that the agreement does indeed cede sovereignty in some ways to the WHO. And what that means is that if we sign this treaty, critics are saying that America will not have the ability to be autonomous if a pandemic should come. We won't have the ability to make our own laws based on the will of the people. And obviously, if we saw COVID last time, those those policies were also not made based on the will of the people. But this will be completely detached from any kind of democratic support whatsoever. And it will just be dictated by the whims of the WHO. Uh, Representative Tim Burchett, a uh, Republican from Tennessee, said at a May press conference last year that the World Health Organization pandemic treaty is very vague. It affects our sovereignty and it could be exploited to tell Americans what kind of health care they need in the event of a global pandemic. The nonprofit advocacy group founded by former Vice President Mike Pence advancing American freedom published a letter blasting the WHO pandemic treaty while also questioning the United States' continued membership in the international body. You'll remember Trump's uh, Trump's position, which was to uh, get out of the WEA, uh, the WHO and to no longer fund the WHO. Just a reminder that uh, Bill Gates is an incredibly large funder of the WHO, which tells you a lot. So here are the concerns that people have expressed when it comes to what the treaty actually says. Number one, there's a focus on equity. There's another propagandistic uh, euphemism right there. So the AAF, that's that nonprofit that was started by Mike Pence, points out that the treaty ostensibly intended to save lives through an international prioritization of the best medical practices emphasizes race and quote unquote equity before every other value in its general principles and approaches. What that means is that you would deprioritize white people. We already actually saw that in the United States, a focus on equity, which was ensuring that black and brown Americans got their vaccines before white Americans did. So that just to decode that for you, that's exactly what it means. OK, so here is what. Uh, the treaty says equity is at the center of pandemic prevention, preparedness and response, both at the national level within states and at the international level between states. It requires uh, specific measures to protect persons in vulnerable situations, fair, equitable and timely access to safe, effective, quality and affordable pandemic related products and services. The whole of Chapter two in the treaty is titled The World Together equitably achieving equity in for and through pandemic prevention preparedness and response each party shall continue to strengthen its health system with a view to the progressive realization of universal health coverage okay so this is political this is a political position this is a progressive political position that's what they want that's what the left has always wanted and the left always finds a way to ran through their policy positions without the support of the people. And yet they say they're the guardians of democracy. Of course, the exact opposite is true. Everything they accuse Republicans of when it comes to tyranny and fascism and control and vying for power is actually true of progressives, is actually true of the Democratic Party. It's always been true of progressives. It's always been true of socialists and communists um, since 
the inception of their ideologies. They will find a way to push universal health care. It looks like this treaty is a part of that. And of course, equity, which again is the idea, it's based on this idea that black and brown people are all oppressed, that white people are all, are all privileged. And so in order to make sure that everyone ends up in the same place, you have to push back white people in a variety of ways, economically, when it comes to health care, when it comes to education, and you have to hoist up black and brown people. So everyone ends up in the same place. The problem is, that's not it's not a true dichotomy. It starts on a false premise. Black and brown people are not automatically oppressed because of their skin color. White people are not automatically privileged uh, because of their skin color. And that is the actually the opposite of what real equity is. Equity, according to God's word, is treating everyone the same, showing no partiality. This form of progressive equity is showing partiality in order to try to get people to show er, or to end up at the same place, which of course is possible. It's what Thomas Sowell calls cosmic justice, and it is wicked. So this is another concern. Here's another concern that the uh, AAF outlines when it comes to this treaty. It threatens the freedom of expression under the guise of misinformation. The AAF also warned about one article in the treaty specifically calling on signing nations to combat false, misleading misinformation or disinformation, including through effective international collaboration and cooperation. So this is what people are talking about when they say it loses, um, we're losing our sovereignty. It seems like it's a collaboration of progressive elites at a variety of countries coming together and deciding how they are going to trample upon the free speech rights of their people in the name of combating misinformation and saving lives. I don't think I even have to explain to you what that looks like because we saw that so clearly during COVID. I mean, people getting censored left and right for just suggesting what is actually true about COVID, about the death rate, about the policies that could actually mitigate disease and prevent death. The parties shall strengthen science, public health, and pandemic literacy in the population. I mean, this is so dystopian and so big brother, it is wild. As well as access to information on pandemics and their effects in drivers and combat false, misleading misinformation, disinformation through effective international collaboration. We know what that means. They use these euphemisms to try to make it sound palatable or innocuous, and they're not. We know what this is. We know what this is. Let me pause, and let me tell you about our next sponsor for the day. Oh, this is another great, great sponsor that is uh, very relevant to what we're talking about, and that is Jace Medical. Another example of not being paranoid, but being prepared. So in addition to that emergency food supply, you probably just want to have an emergency prescription supply as well. Um, that medication that you rely on on a daily basis that your spouse or kids rely on, you want to make sure that you have a year-long supply of that just in case, just in case anything should happen. You can't get your medication through the traditional means. You should have a year-long supply as well as the most common antibiotics for common bacterial uh, infections. You want to make sure that you have those on hand. That can be life-saving. Hopefully, you'll never need this year long stash but if you do need it you'll have it it's better to be safe than sorry when it comes to this and it's just another way to protect your family should some kind of emergency happen in our supply chain go to jacemedical.com use code ally at checkout for a discount jacemedical.com code ally All right. Um, another concern that the AAF has, it says uh, that the proposed treaty would also give the WHO control of international supply chains in the event of another pandemic event uh, in, intended to allow more efficient manipulation of resources under the guise of Equity. So this is from the treaty in partnership and collaboration with relevant international, regional and other organizations and be guided by equity and public health needs, paying particular attention to the needs of developing country party. So again, there's what they that's what they mean by equity. They're prioritizing um, who gets, I guess, the most resources based on what they consider uh, a more developed or a more developing country. Now, I'm not saying that those countries don't need more help. Perhaps they do need more resources, but 
the collaboration of a One Health approach to distribute resources based on the subjective whims of a corrupt organization that, again, is very interested in the rise to power, the continued rise to power and prominence of the Chinese Communist Party and other evil actors. I'm not so sure. I'm not so tr- sure I want to trust them with that um, uh, with that distribution. Um, so more on Disease X. This has been reported on several times. Just a few months ago, the Daily Mail was reporting on this, uh, reporting on what some of the quote-unquote uh, experts are saying that, again, this outbreak might be even worse. And I just want to note one thing that they said. China is the most likely place the new avian virus would first appear, he said, because the country often records cases of human uh, with a uh, human infection with avian influenza. And of course, we don't think that that's why there are all of these uh, labs there, not just in China, but doing very dangerous research, developing these kinds of diseases. They say it's to, you know, be able to prepare us and to protect us in the future. But apparently, as we saw with the Wuhan lab, um, the right protections and regulations are not in place. Now, maybe you say that that's intentional. Maybe it was accidental, but okay, even if it's not that, even if it really is just disease, so let's go with the bat soup theory and the, um, that there's just avian flus, uh, that happen in China. Stop, stop being gross. Why does that need to happen? Why does it have to be China? Change how fundamentally how you act if that is the case. If the case is that all of these flus and all of these diseases are organically happening because of how the animals are eaten and treated there, you're doing a disservice to the people of China and you're doing a disservice to the world and you need to fundamentally change the practices that are leading to that kind of spread of disease that's killing millions of people around the world. Like, don't you think the WHO, like, let's all sign a treaty that tells China to change and to stop spreading those diseases, if that's really the case. I don't even think that's the case. But if the WHO were worth its salt, it would say, hey, China, can you, like, can you stop eating the bats? Um, the good news, so they say, the experts interviewed say rapid advances in vaccine technology and antivirals demonstrate the pharmaceutical industry would be able to rapidly roll out treatments against a pandemic disease when the next arises. You know, the the pharmaceutical industry, they're just, they're the best. They're so sweet. And they're so generous and kind. And the great thing is, is that they do it all just out of the goodness of their heart. And they certainly have no interest in another pandemic and another disease so they can develop more vaccines and medications i mean it's yes okay it could it could be i mean if you like just want to go there and theorize that it might be the billions and billions and billions of dollars that they're making but it's probably not that it's probably just the pharmaceutical companies that they're just little sweeties and they just want to help us out so thank you so much um to Pfizer, which leads me to the next sponsor. Just kidding. Just kidding. I scared y'all for a second. Not sponsored by Pfizer. Okay, this is according to the New York Post. And uh, this was reported just a couple just a couple weeks ago. Chinese lab crafts mutant COVID-19 strain with 100% kill rate <laughs> in humanized mice. This is exciting. This is good. Um, <laughs> surprisingly, rapid death, they say. Uh, the study is the first of its kind to report a 100% mortality rate in mice infected by the COVID-19 related virus, far surpassing previously reported results from another study. The researchers, uh, the researchers wrote, um... Francois Ballou, an epidemiology expert at University College London's Genetics Institute, slammed the research, though, so this is better, as terrible and scientifically totally pointless. So he said this. I had to look at the preprint. It's a terrible study. Scientifically totally pointless. I can see nothing of vague interest that could be learned from force infecting a weird breed of humanized mice with a random virus. Conversely, I could see how much stuff might go wrong. Right. Um. So. Great news. They are injecting humanized mice with a disease that no one wants and no one needs that is killing them and could probably leak to 
everyone else and kill us all too. So, um, good news on your Tuesday afternoon. Uh, Disease X bill in Congress. Apparently, that's something that's happening. HR uh, 3832, also known as Disease X Act of 2023, was introduced in the House on June 5th, 2023, and referred to the Subcommittee on Health. The status has not changed since then, but the bill's purpose is to establish a program at the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority for developing medical countermeasures for viral threats with pandemic potential. Um, Tedros also posted a tweet just the other day on my birthday. This, I mean, this is what, this is what you see when you enter into the gates of hell is this picture right here. Thank you, Secretary Hillary Clinton, for a great discussion on global health challenges, including pandemic preparedness for the hashtag pandemic accord. Well, that's, that's again, very scary. Um, Outkick writer Ian Miller, we've had Ian Miller on this podcast before, and he was like the foremost data gatherer when it came to masks and mask mandates and showing just through statistics that mask mandates do not work at all. Uh, He wrote this in response to that very scary, uh, very scary picture that could be the new cover for the latest edition of Dante's Inferno. He said, outstanding, could not have written, uh, could not have scripted it any better. The World Health Organization is a joke. So of course, Hillary Clinton is full steam ahead on giving them even more control with the pandemic accord after they repeatedly lied and spread harmful information when it came to the pandemic. Okay, so that's what's going on with disease X. We've got a corrupt organization run by a corrupt man who is not a medical doctor who is pushing for an international treaty that countries would sign saying in the event of a pandemic we promise to police speech to try to hamper so-called misinformation and disinformation and to um, spread the resources of health equitably, of course, based, I am sure, on racial quotas um, in an effort to bring the world into a, a one health future for universal health care coverage. And so when he says, when Tedros says this has nothing to do with national sovereignty, this is not going to, this is not going to hurt your rights in any way, all right, then he's going to be okay with some edits that we want to make to it. I don't see any reason at all for any treaty. There's no good reason for it. Zero good reason. Every nation has to do what is best for their people. And every policy decision is a difficult decision to make. It's a push and pull decision. It is not, um, well, this is going to save the most amount of lives, lives, so it's just as easy as that. And so we just keep everyone inside and we, you know, put masks on two-year-olds. No, there are a lot of things to weigh when it comes to policies, yes, even when it comes to pandemic policy, you have to weigh people's livelihoods. You have to weigh people's ability to socialize. You have to weigh in people's ability to get an education. You have to weigh in people's freedoms, their constitutional rights. But our constitutional rights in many ways were suspended for this pandemic. And in my view, this treaty just ensures and enshrines that suspension should the next pandemic come. And I hope they're wrong. I hope that it doesn't. But gosh, here's here's one thing I will say is that I do not want Joe Biden or any Democrat in office when that next pandemic hits. I pray that it doesn't. But that is for sure. Man, who we elect in November is going to have a huge and perhaps extremely imminent effect on our freedoms and on our rights. Now, it's true that Trump really didn't demonstrate that much uh, that much of a desire to protect our freedoms. I mean, he didn't fire Fauci, and he chastised, for example, 
uh, Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia, when he opened back up and ended his lockdowns, he chastised him at a press conference. I just remember watching that and being like, seriously? So hopefully, if Trump wins, that he has learned his lesson. But I'm telling you, anyone is better than a Democrat in office this November because something like this is on the line. And we've already seen the blueprint of what they want to do and how they want to drastically change your life and take over all power of every government in order to ensure that you comply. Um, it's very important to all their plans. And it sounds like a grand conspiracy, except they basically just say this stuff at Davos every year and they hope that people don't pay attention. But even if people do pay attention, they don't really care. Um, and so I know it sounds like a black pill. I know it sounds, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? It, ha But it really matters who we elect locally, who we elect on a state level, and who we elect nationally. As long as our elections still truly have consequences, as long as we have elections, they absolutely matter. Like America still has a place of strength and has a place of prominence and influence on the world stage. And we can make or break something like this. Unfortunately, the Democrats here, I mean, they're in the pocket of the CCP too. Of course they are. And so they're not going to be any help. They've already completely sold us out to the highest bidder. Um, but people who love America, who happen to be almost all of them in the Republican Party right now, there are a lot of people in the Republican Party that hate America too, though. But as far as people who love America, almost all of them happen to also be Republicans. Um, it can really make a difference. So who we vote for, statewide, local elections, national, it really, really matters and will really, really make a difference. All right. Let me tell you about our last sponsor for the day. That is Good Ranchers. All right. Good Ranchers has an awesome deal going on right now. They're offering... Uh, they're offering free bacon for four years. I thought that was a typo. Let me just read this to you word for word. What? Okay. Right now, subscribe to any of their 100% Good Ranchers 100% American meat boxes to secure their leap year offer of free bacon for four years. What? That is crazy. That is over 70 pounds of applewood smoked bacon. You'll get just by subscribing. Wake up and smell the savings at GoToRanchers.com. Use code Allie. This is all 100% American meat. Subscribe to whatever box you want. We love their pre-marinated chicken, their non-pre-marinated chicken. It's all great. We always have a freezer full of Good Ranchers meat. Subscribe to that box. It'll show up at your front door every month, and you'll get four years of free bacon. That is insane. Go to GoToRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout. That's GoToRanchers.com. Code Allie. All right, that's all we got time for today. Let's just remember, guys, because I know when we talk about something big like that, whenever we talk about the WHO or the UN or the WEF or the, all, all the different acronyms, whenever we talk about these things, it makes you feel very small and very powerless. And while it's important for us to know about these things and to be prepared to make sure our elected officials know about these things and that they're prepared to push back and to stand up for our freedom – the fact of the matter is, is that we only have control over so much. We have control over very little. And really, we have been given a t relatively tiny plot of earth to steward and to make better, to maximize, to beautify. We do not have the capacity to care about everything all at once. You can't be panicked about everything. You can't fear everything. You can't even have compassion for everything. I know that we're told today that you have to have empathy for everyone and everything all at once. God did not make you to do that. He didn't make you to have the ability to do that. Only God can see everything, can know everything, can carry everything. Only he has the ability to do that because he's infinite. We are finite. We can't carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. And so I do my best to balance, not just on the show, but in my own life, like knowing about something, making sure I know about an issue, but not allowing it to consume me um, and not allowing it to, uh, you know, make me live in fear or in a state of existential dread. And so, gosh, we have to balance 
not just our preparedness, um, but just like our, our knowledge of what's going on with prayer, with trusting God's sovereignty, and then refocusing on what's right in front of us. So you listen to this podcast. Okay, you've got some knowledge. Maybe for one of you, if this is something that sets you off on like a long research project and you really dig into it and you do something about it. And that's great. I mean, there are always those kinds of subjects out there for different people, but maybe it's just something that you put in your back pocket and then you trust God with it because I can't tell you how many times a week I hear something like, oh, we're about to get nuked by Iran. Oh, we're about to get hit with 100% uh, mortality rate disease called disease X and they're going to take our sovereignty. Oh, the WEF is and BlackRock are teaming together to take all of our property and our finances. Oh, the border is wide open. Oh, judges and prosecutors don't care about crime anymore and they're just allowing murderers to go out in the street. And I'm like, well, there is nothing I can do about it right now. Uh, There's nothing I can do about it. Um, A lot of times there are. I mean, as I said, getting involved in local elections and things like that, obviously that's a big deal. Maybe God is calling you to run for one of those offices. But the truth is we can only do what is right in front of us at any given moment. I always think about that C.S. Lewis quote, and I'll have to paraphrase it. Um, That's basically like, look, all of us were ordained to die. Before we were born, we were all ordained to die. And many of us were, were ordained to die in very grotesque ways and in painful ways. And the introduction of a new pathogen or uh, a new threat of nuclear attack or a new threat of invasion, whatever it is, it doesn't change that. All of us, were already going to die. And we are still going to die. And our calling as Christians remains the same just as it has been since the inception of the church, which is to glorify God and to love our neighbor and to raise our families well and to disciple our kids and to work hard, heartily for the Lord and not for man and to trust that God is not only in control, but he is really good and that he is coming back and that victory is his. And that gives us our joy and faith and hope while still, yes, caring about the material. We do. We're not Gnostics. We care about the body. We care about people. We care about the economy. We care about national security. We care about borders. God has given us all these things. We occupy a physical space and a physical material context. And God has given us that purposely and providentially. We have to care about those things and cultivate those things with our eyes towards heaven. It's a very interesting tension. And it will only be on the other side of eternity that that tension releases. But we are not in a unique place in history and that the history of humanity has been characterized mostly by suffering and tyranny. And we have lived in this beautiful respite of American history where we have had rights. Um, And I hope that that lasts for a very, very long time, but it will not last without our grace-driven effort uh, towards that, which starts in your home and by doing the next right thing in faith with excellence and for the glory of God. All right, Relatable, we will be back here tomorrow.